Great to have you here, and uh, we want to welcome Apostle Mike as he comes to bring the word this morning. While we put our hands together and open our hearts to receive the man of God this morning. Wow, I am so looking forward to Christmas show. I, it's just, it's so stunning. I was just, I only heard two songs. I was in tears. The atmosphere was so good. The excellence and the standards, so amazing. You're just amazing. And so come and be part of it. If you're watching online, get in, bring your friends. It'll be great. And turn up for Christmas in the car park. That'll be something else, won't it? <laughs> and uh, I'm so, so delighted and, and blessed that my son is leading men in prayer. It's a great way to turn a nation around, and it certainly is a great way to turn homes around. Have the men leading in prayer. I think it's awesome. Well, special welcome for those who are watching online. We're sorry you can't be here, but you're going to be blessed anyway, and uh, I want you just to be with us in spirit and be open to what God wants to say. Um, I, I bought a series of messages. Each one is actually built on the one before it. So I'm going to cover a little bit of ground just so we get back in mind what I was sharing. Uh, I want to talk this time about the great end time revival. The great end time revival. The great end time revival. So the first, let's just open up with a few thoughts. First, first thing to realize is God has a story. You know, I asked the question a little while ago, you know, for, for success in life, you have to have a game plan. How many think God might have a game plan? If he's got a game plan, then he's got something he's working towards called his story, history. And so God is always waiting and inviting you to, waiting for you to invite him into your story because you have a story too. You have a place you've come from, you have a journey, you have life experiences, you have a story. And God wants to enter your story and bring you to a new dimension wants to break you free of the limitations of where you came from and unlock in you the destiny he already had for you so you might be a person of faith, you might rise above and do things you never thought you could do. So first he comes into your life when you invite him to bring forgiveness, to bring eternal life, to bring uh, an establishment of uh, truth in your life of who you are. Then he invites you into his story. And that's the bit a lot of people don't get that they just want Jesus to come in and change their life and make it a better life and be there to help them. But it's more than that. There's a bigger purpose in mind. God has a plan and he wants you to come into and be a great participant in his story, to be a a, a part of that. He has a a purpose that he's working to and the Bible says it's an eternal purpose. Look at this, Ephesians 3.10, to the intent that now... So this is working out now to the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the church, in the church or by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. So he's saying God wants to now demonstrate through his people his wisdom, to put his wisdom on display. Now when Pastor Dave was talking about the cross, it was a very powerful message. He could, he could have just had an altar call right on that. The cross is central to how God operates. To the world, it's foolishness. To God, it's wisdom. And when we surrender our life and the power of God is shown, the the manifold wisdom of God is demonstrated to spiritual powers. And it says in verse 11, according to the eternal purpose, he purposed in Christ Jesus. So God has an intentional plan he's working towards. It's an eternal plan. That word eternal is the word age. It spans ages. We're gonna come back to that in a moment. eh? So if you walk with God and you love Him and you're in His calling, then God, the Bible says God can make everything work for your good. So you can either look out at life and see the challenges, the difficulties, the pressures, the setbacks and whatever, and be overwhelmed with discouragement. Or if your mind is set on walking with God in His calling for your life, then within every problem that comes, there's an opportunity in the hand of God to make it work for your benefit. That's what it tells us. Romans 8, 28, we know all things work together for good, for those who love God and who are called according to His purpose. So here's the thing about the Bible. The Bible covers the history of man. The Bible is God's unveiling of His eternal purposes. So when Christ came, 
His, his life fulfilled over a hundred prophecies. Can you imagine over thousands of years, people writing down prophecies, words they heard from God about something they didn't know anything about, and then a hundred or more of those were fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. That has got to be the, big, the best record I've ever heard. But there are hundreds of other prophecies that concern his, his return. And so when you look then at the Bible, it's not just a jumble of things that are together. It's actually a well-constructed plan that outlines in various places God's purpose for mankind. Now, in the last couple of sessions, I shared a message called The Age to Come. Remember, I shared the scripture in Matthew 12, verse 32. If any man speaks a word against the Son of Man, it'll be forgiven him. Whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven him either in this age or the age to come. And Peter, uh, Paul spoke the same thing in Ephesians 1.21. Christ is exalted far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, every name that's named, not only in this age, but the age to come. So the Bible tells us then that there are ages, spans of time when God is working something out. When that age comes to an end, another age begins, he's working something different out. And we shared about that. And we saw that the, there were certain things about the age to come, certain characteristics, and uh, I won't go into the details. You can look at the message, but here's what they were. Number one, Jesus will return and assert his right to rule over the creation. Secondly, Satan will be bound for a thousand years, creating then a spiritual atmosphere free of demonic defilement. Third, believers who've served faithfully in every generation will be raised from the dead and rewarded by service. Fourthly, the government of Jesus will expand and fill the whole earth, every aspect of creation, and it will be done over a period of a thousand years. However, the transition to that age will be marked by the coming of Christ, by resurrection of some people, and by great upheaval. So we saw that was the age to come. Now then, we're going to take to the next one. Then we went backwards a little bit. So now let's look at the present age. And when I shared a, I shared a scripture out of Galatians 1.4, uh, Jesus gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of God our Father. So the age we're in now, that span of time or history, God calls it present. It's the now. And he calls it evil. It is painful, it is difficult, it is burdensome, and there are destructive forces at work everywhere in the spirit realm. And we saw when we studied that study, we saw that it's characterized by several things. Number one, it was called an evil age. Number two, it's dominated by the influence of demonic spirits in the spirit world. It's characterized by spiritual blindness. People don't get it. They don't see spiritual things. It is characterized by hostility to the gospel, people and Christians uh, across the world being persecuted. Uh, but it was also characterized by the powers of the age to come are now available by faith to us. That we can now reach in for the power of God to save people. We can reach in by faith to the age to come and deliverance comes now. We can reach in by faith and healing comes now. We can reach in by faith and miracles come now. It's like a, it's in a trickle at the moment. It'll be in its fullness then. But right now we need to stir faith to see God move in a greater dimension. Okay. Now, that, that, that's the summary of those two messages. Now, I want to go back again now, and we're going to now look uh, at, I want to look at what God is doing in terms of his plan now. Because if you, if you don't know where you are in the plan now, you miss the opportunity and the challenge that God is calling you to rise to. See, so I'm going to give you a brief coverage of what God has been doing over the last 2,000 years. Gonna keep it really brief, but it'll give you key points. And those things, each of them need to be studied. You need to understand the legacy that this house has been built on. It didn't just happen. It didn't just come into being. And things we do are not just because we like doing them. It's because we're building on a legacy of a move of God and the truth that was given to us from that move. Does that make sense to you? 
So, so if we just start off and look just at the early church and see when Jesus set up the church, he didn't choose religious people, he just chose business people. And they were all young, they were in their late teens and early 20s. They were all very young people that Jesus chose to change the world. You gotta realize that. He didn't choose old wise people. He didn't choose people that had studied in Bible school or were in the temple or anything like that. He chose, he chose young men, young men with a, who were already active in business of some kind. Those were the kinds of people he wanted to use for what he was planning to build. He wasn't planning to reproduce what was there. He was planning something different. And so uh, the church began with Jesus gathering some men and training them and preparing them and putting vision in them. And then they gathered people together and they said, there is something God is about to do. We need to pray and pull it into the earth. And so for 10 days they prayed and in Acts 2, there was a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The church began, not in a Bible school, it began with a move of God. It began when the heavens opened and the glory and the power of God came on people. They were transformed. They began to speak in tongues. They became bold in their spirit. That was it. And then Jesus, uh, Peter, who was very, very uh, timid and very frightened, stood up in Acts 2 verse 38. He stood up when everyone gathered around. There were thousands gathered because of the noise. And he said, repent everyone and be baptized in the name of the Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you'll receive the Holy Ghost. This promise is for you, your children, all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And so those who gladly received his word were baptized and about 3,000 souls. Now that's a very big altar call. Now think about that how hard it is to manage a dozen people coming up to give their life to Christ. They've suddenly got 3,000. They've got 12 apostles that Jesus raised up and now suddenly 3,000 people. And that was the first day. That is the beginning. Multitude of people have come to know Jesus Christ and got water baptized. And it says, and then it says, and notice this, those who gladly received his word were baptized and it says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers. Fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done. And all who believed were together. And they had all things common. They sold possessions and goods and divided them and shared them to those in need. And here it is. They continued daily with one accord in the temple, because the temple was still there. And they, they met house to house. And breaking bread from house to house, ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with God and the people. And the Lord added daily. So not only have you got the church, 3,000, now you've got them adding daily. Now, how are you gonna build a church that keeps growing so quickly? There's no building will contain it. So, but the one thing that multiplies with people are houses. When the church increases and there's large numbers of people come, there are now large numbers of houses available for people to meet in. So the early church was led by the apostles. However, the church grew because of the people. Amen. You've got to see this because over the years, the mindset about church has changed and instead of it being a powerful body of people filled with the Holy Ghost, witnessing boldly, praying for people, sharing the gospel, being an example and a light, it, it becomes limited to a handful of people doing a job. That, that, that is part of the Middle Ages. That's part of the fall away of the church in the Dark Ages. Now, you'll see that as we share today. So notice the church began with two things, an outpouring of the Holy Ghost, large numbers of people meeting together in houses. And what did they do? The apostles went around and taught them in their houses. They prayed, they fellowshiped together, they praised the Lord together, the power of God came. There were healings, there were deliverances in the houses. That's how it happened. That is the church Jesus started with. I think he's gonna get that church back again. I think that church is back again, eh? And not only that, it says, now, you know, how many did we say? 3,000? Okay, and then you see the added daily. Now it says in Acts 6, 1, it says the number of disciples was multiplying. So now God's adding to the church and now he's multiplying. So if you've got 3,000, you just multiply it by two. There's 6,000 right there. If you multiply it by three, then, well, there we've got, we got 9,000 right away. Now, you understand that 12 men can't manage all of that. 
because God never intended them to. God intended ordinary believers would start to gather together, be led by the Holy Spirit, live a life that loved and honoured Jesus and invite and include people in their homes. You getting the idea? That's the church, see? And it says, and so what happened? Well, what caused the church to grow gradually is the apostles were overworked and said, well, not right. We should be focusing on prayer and the Word and equipping the people. We should release from all of the day-to-day stuff. And so they raised up some people and they laid hands on them. And the moment they empowered them, these guys, ordinary guys in the church, suddenly they're out doing miracles. They're out laying hands on people. They're out doing all kinds of things. And the church grew rapidly. It grew because people were equipped and empowered and activated to carry the life of the Holy Ghost. That is the church Jesus is building. You're all getting quiet again on me now. So, so how, did, how, did they, how did the gospel go into the whole of the known world? Well, think about it. How did the gospel go? In the, uh, well, it's very, very simple. It wasn't the apostles who did that. The apostles all stayed in Jerusalem. God raised up a persecution and it was so severe, all the believers in Jerusalem fled and they went out and everywhere they went, they preached the gospel. And that's how it went. It went out by ordinary believers sharing the Word of God. Now, the Holy Ghost highlights a few people and what they did. Paul is highlighted because of his powerful apostolic ministry, but many others are highlighted for the miracles that they did as well. That's how it was meant to happen. It said in Acts chapter 8, verse 4, they were scattered and they went everywhere preaching the Word of God. So God wants you to preach the Word of God wherever you are. But you've got to know it. You've got to have that passion in your own heart and then share what God has to say. The message of hope. Jesus is here. So, and then the believers minister. Now, if you have a look, if you were to look at, if you were to just go into your concordance and search and put two words in, church, comma, house or church in the house. And you will find statements like this in Romans 16.5. Likewise, greet the church in their house. Romans 16.5. Greet the church in their house. 1 Corinthians 16.19. Greet the church in their house. Colossians 4.15. And the church that's in his house. The church grew in the houses. People just got people in for home. They had a big feed. If you have a big feed, people love to come. Right? Moira says, yes, see, I've got one person in agreement with me there. <laughs> well, food is the way you gather people together. Food in the, in the, in the Asian culture or the Middle Eastern culture is a way of honouring people. You put on food and you invite them. It's an honour to them. They come into the home because there's food. And then they share the gospel, preach and pray, pray for needs, pray for the sick, pray for people to get healed, pray for people to get delivered of evil spirits. It's not for specialist people. This is for believers. These signs shall follow them that believe. These signs you follow them that believe. And not special people. These signs follow them that believe, that have faith in their heart. God could use them to heal someone, to deliver someone. That's where God moved. That's what the church was like. That's what God will bring it back to. Come on, yeah, that's true. Come on. Come on. <laughs> so, so of course what happened is it, it, grew, it grew because they were gathering. There was centers of prayer and the power of God in homes all over the cities. And the church grew and grew and grew and grew. However, it grew, it grew so far and so fast, they tried to persecute it when, the, when persecution failed. Now listen, they tried to do that in China. They tried to persecute the church. So they shut down all the big buildings like this. And what do people do? They just met in homes. And when the, when the borders finally opened up in China, there are now millions and millions of house churches all over the place. The believers just got together in their homes. So, so by the year 300 AD, Emperor Constantine had come in and taken over and he was in charge and he decided to incorporate the church into the state and make it the state religion. And when he did that, then the revival was over. And so the church went through a season where it became connected to the state, seeking the approval of the state, endorsing the state. There was an entanglement between church and state that should never have been. And the church entered the dark ages, no move of God, just trickles of God's spirit moving in different places. And so so we find then that God needed to restore it. God needed to restore the church. The church needed restoring and God decided he would restore it. 
So what happens is, and I want to share with you now some of the restoration of the church. Now, there's a lot of things to say, but I want to get it just down and talk about five moves of restoration. And I'll explain exactly what they are, and then I'll tell you what the next one is, the one that's coming. Because if you know what's coming, then you can be one of those people who sees it coming and prepares to participate, or who fails to participate and God moves past you and chooses those who will. He's always done it that way. So the, the major restoration movements of God are stories of men and women of God who heard him in their generation. Sometimes we look back and we make these people really big people rather than realize they were ordinary people who heard God. These are people, men and women, who heard Jesus and followed him in their generation, just like he calls you. These are men and women who overcame the fear of man and persecution. These are stories of men and women who sacrificed their lives for what God was showing them to be true. They gave up their life. Multitudes were tortured and put to death. For example, some of you have a Bible, some of you don't. Now, the Bible you have comes to you courtesy of a man called William Tyndall. The Bible was originally in Latin, so only, or, only special people could read it. And he said, ordinary people need to have access to the Word of God. So he set out to translate the Bible from Latin to English and then print it and make it available for the multitudes. He was captured, he was tied to a post, and he was strangled and burnt to death. What was he burnt to death for? For daring to make the Bible, the Word of God, available for you. Your faith is built on the sacrifice of men like that. You understand? It's built on people's sacrifice. That's why you need to know a little bit about where we've come from so you honour the sacrifices the generation that went ahead made. See, for most of you here, you've come into this building, but you don't know the sacrifice the previous generation made. So it's just the same with the things we do and believe. We need to understand that when God moves in restoration, someone has to hear him and believe and carry it and there's a price to carrying it because there'll be a battle over it. And that's what's happened. Let me just give you and explain to you the different major moves of God. And in all of them, people lost their lives. All of them, people lost their lives. So that's why we look back. You look back and you honor the men of God who in their generation were the carriers of a revival and restoration move. You honor them by holding on to and discovering and holding the truth they taught. We honor them by passing it on to others. And we honor them when we listen to God in our generation and we follow what he says. Make sense to you? Okay, then we've got to run our race. So the Bible prophesies about restoration. Here it is in Acts 3.18. These things God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, Jesus Christ would suffer, and this has already happened, and it's been fulfilled. So repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. So times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Here it is. That he may send Jesus Christ who has preached to you before, whom heaven must receive or hold on to until the times of restoration of all things God has spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the word began. So what he's saying is, you remember the prophecy about the Savior coming and being crucified. That's all happened. He said, now there's a lot of other prophets all through from one end to the other have prophesied about a period called times of restoration, times when God returns things to what it was always intended to be. And he said, all of that has to happen about the coming of the Lord. So over 1,500 years, the earth fell away, the the, the church fell away. So What is a restoration movement? There are two words just to get and understand. One is what you call renewal. When you have renewal, the Holy Spirit just falls on people and now they start to have an experience with God. They get healed. They get touched by God, filled with the Holy Ghost. They come alive. So renewal gets you fired up again. We need renewal constantly. But restoration is a bit different to that. Restoration comes when there's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So we get renewed, but then God reveals something to the church church some truth that it's long forgotten 
or some experience it's long forgotten. In other words, it's not something that's new. It's something that was written in the Bible, but it was either not understood in its time or it got lost over the church history. So when God has a restoration move, he puts things into place which were missing, which were lost over the generations. Now you come into this church and all of you to some degree or another have already taken hold of things that people paid a price to hold on to that truth in their day. So many of them were, were tortured and killed and murdered and terribly treated. There was no escape. Okay then, so, so a restoration then, a sovereign move of God comes and he begins to re restore some particular truth. Now here's the problem though. There are many different responses when God is doing something new. Many different responses. Some welcome it. Yay! Bring it on, Lord. Hungry for truth. See? And they walk in the blessing of it and God is on their life and they have an unusual supernatural favour in their walk with God. Others didn't hear about it, so they miss out. Others, they have a mindset. That can't be right. We've never seen this before. This is different. No, we reject it completely. And I've been through all of this. I've actually seen it happen in this very place here. When God poured His Spirit out and people were all over the place, there were open visions of heaven, angels were being seen, people were laughing. There were people who just went, nope, nope, this is not God. Laughter can't be God. You understand, a religious mindset shut them down from participating in what God was doing. I've seen it here. I remember getting pastors in the city together to hear the minister share and all they could do was attack her. In other words, they were not open to a fresh move of God because it came in a way different to what they expected. Does that make sense to you? And that's always been the way. So some uh, embrace the new truth and then they just get overcome because the pressure trying to stand in it and others, they just choose to persecute those and destroy them. So as I share about these moves, all of them were moves that caused massive upheavals. Here they are. There's, I'll just give you five of them and uh, within them there's other little ones, but here they are. The first one, and you'll, you'll know this one, is what you call the, how many know the word Protestant? Yeah. Protestant? Well, you are a Protestant because you're protesting. <laughs> really? I mean, the Protestant movement began with Martin Luther, who protested against the practices of the Roman Catholic Church of his day, and God gave him revelation of a foundational truth. When he stood up and began to declare that truth, there was an upheaval overtook Europe. There were persecutions everywhere. People were put to death for their faith. People were tortured for their faith. He had to flee to Germany to be protected. That was in the 1500s. Then the next major move of God took place over a couple of hundred years. It was called what they called the holiness movement from 1600 through to nearly 1900. And you would hear of people like, or you'd know people like Martin, uh, uh, Charles Wesley. How many of you heard the name Wesley? How many heard of Wesley? There you go. Well, you're named after someone famous. You're named after a man who carried a move of God. And his teaching was about holiness. His teaching was about so on and so forth. Okay, then the next major move was in the 1900s, early 1900s, 1908 in Azusa Street when the Holy Ghost fell and there was a major move of God and people got filled with the Holy Spirit and they got so filled with the Holy Spirit, spoke in tongues and there was an overflow and there was a global revival called what's called Pentecostalism. That's where it came from, see? And then in the 1950s, uh, from about 1948 through to uh, around about, about 1980, there's a season in history called the Charismatic Movement. Charismatic Movement was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but within that were some other movements. I'll, I'll come back over this in just a moment. Uh, within that, there was what's called the Latter Rain Movement. This church was built and birthed from a Latter Rain Movement revival. Okay, and then following that, there was the charismatic renewal where the Holy Spirit fell in the churches. That was about the time I got born again. I was a Catholic at that time. I went to a Catholic church in Auckland and there were hundreds and hundreds of people doing what's called a life in the spirit seminar. Hundreds of them getting filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues and worshiping in the spirit. Something just unbelievable. And it was happening all over the globe. 
Uh, and then there was what came out about a similar time was the faith movement where uh, Kenneth Hagin came and he began to preach faith and clearing the word of faith and so on. So these are movements. And then finally, in the uh, 1980s to 2000, is what called the prophetic apostolic movement. So all of these are movements and all of them bought something. Now, here's the thing. How many know that God always works intentionally? Okay, so when God does restoration work, he always does it according to patterns. And of course, it's not surprising then there's some patterns here. So if you were to uh, have a look in, uh, if you were to read in, uh, say for example, Hebrews chapter, Hebrews chapter six, verse one and two, it'll tell you about the foundational doctrines of Christ, which are repentance from dead works, faith towards God, the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection from the dead and eternal judgments. Those are what's called the foundational doctrines the base doctrines you need to know and need to understand to be grounded. Now, get this. The first movement of God with Martin Luther established the first foundation that we must repent from dead works. We must repent from dead works. So the Protestant movement brought back the first foundation. There must be a repentance from dead works. Works, lifeless works trying to please God and gain his approval. Lifeless works trying to earn our salvation. The, and, and so the, the Lutherans grew out of that. The Presbyterians came out of that. The Anglicans, all of those churches came up out of that. And they all, if you go there, their fundamental teaching will be repentance from dead works and faith towards God. The next move, the evangelical move, the holiness move, uh, their, their very strong mandate was personal faith towards God and being set apart. One of the things they introduced was water baptism. And there was a horrendous persecution. They, they were killed. Some of them were drowned just because they got water baptized. Uh, the next movement, the Pentecostal movement, restored then the uh, doctrine of uh, laying on, uh, the doctrine of baptisms, baptism in the Holy Spirit. So you notice then the first movement established being uh, repentance from dead works. Then it moved on to the faith towards God. Then it moved on to baptisms, water baptism. Then on to baptism in the Holy Ghost. So what would you expect to come next? You expect to come next if it's following a pattern would be laying on hands. Well then that's where the next revival came. So if you have a look at the charismatic movement, which began in 19. 48, there was a move of God. There were miracles, amazing miracles. I mean, they would bring people up and wheelchairs were left one side of the stage to the other. It was an amazing move of God. It was out of that move, many evangelists were born. And, and so it was a great move of God. And what they restored then was Holy Spirit baptism, but they restored laying on of hands for healing, laying on of hands for deliverance. Before that, no one ever did that. You never did that. I mean, you're used to it. You see people lay hands. Just, but that actually came out of a move of God, 1948. And, and it spread through all the, the denominations. And uh, it also emphasized David's tabernacle, praise and worship. It also emphasized members all being ministers and the fivefold ministry being rest restored. You get any idea? Okay, then in the a little bit later, the uh, 80s then, the apostolic prophetic movement, and that's another movement, which is the current movement that's happening now, and its purpose was to bring restoration of the fivefold ministry gifts to the church. Now, there's a pattern in all of this. They bought, this is their emphasis, their emphasis was people need to be equipped. Their emphasis was seminars to equip people to hear the word, the voice of God, to lay hands. Now, when I came into the things of God, I came in under the charismatic movement, the, in, in just in the middle of the movement, just starting to fade. And we came in, and at that stage, there was a Jesus movement. There were hippies all over the world being saved and coming, getting filled with the Holy Ghost, coming out of the drug culture in the 60s. There was the churches where there was movements of God, and there was division. There was all kinds of issues going on. And then following that, we got involved in a Pentecostal church and we started to hear these other truths. And then, of course, in the more recent years, we've, we're, you, some of you would have, may have remembered Chris Gabbard, who was a prophet. He came and did a prophet, prophetic seminars here. We've started to have training seminars and so on. Until finally now, it's another season. It's another season. And the season is one of equipping the saints, equipping the saints. So all of these moves of God 
are moving towards something. Now, so if you were to go back through the period of the last 50 years, in the 50s, there was restoration of evangelists. There was a surge of evangelists. It's when Billy Graham came on the scene. Great healing evangelists. Then there was a surge in the 60s of pastors and small groups and home groups. Then in the 70s, there was a surge of teachers and teaching courses. Then in the 80s, there was a surge of prophets and prophetic seminars and equipping people. Then in the 90s, you start to hear about apostles and of course, with every movement, you had lots of funny stuff go on. With every movement, you had those who were for it and went in whole hog. You had those who were against it, those who fought against it, those who embraced it, and God touched them and changed them. So, but God has been systematically and intentionally moving. Now, notice this. In, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, it says, God has set in the church. God has set. Jesus set in the church. He has given gifts. Apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, teachers. Now notice, he's been in successive waves of movement restoring them. First evangelists, then pastors, then the teachers, then the prophets, now apostles. Now many people don't accept apostles. Many people don't accept prophets. They'll generally accept evangelists and pastors, maybe teachers. You understand, they're resistant to the revelation of what these ministries bring. God, though, has been restoring them. Now, if if God has been moving systematically like that, what must come next? Because you're not sort of, well, I've done it, that's it. There's more got to come now. And the question then is, if God has intentionally over decades restored first this ministry, then that one, then that one, then that one, then that one, until now he's got all five together, what is he doing and what will be next? Very good. Yeah. You, you see, he's working intentionally. We saw, for example, we saw in the major movements of God, he was restoring the foundations. Repentance, faith, Water baptism, baptism in the Holy Ghost, laying on our hands for equipping and empowering. What would be the next two? Resurrection and eternal judgment. They are the movements yet to come. They are the big moves yet to come. But in the meantime, God has been doing something else. On a smaller scale, he's been restoring all of the fivefold ministries for this purpose. And you, when you get it, you'll see it. Then you see where you are in the plan and what your part is that you've got to play in the plan. I get, I get the idea? So, so Jesus has divided his mantle. He, he carried the whole mantle. Now, here's the next great move of God. It's very clear that God is doing a preparation work and it centers around what God is up to next. Now, here's what I reckon is going to happen. There have been five major restoration moves that cause global turmoil in the church world, if not in the natural world as well. I believe there are two more to come because God tends to work in seven. Simple. He's quite predictable in some ways. eh? Okay then. So what would be the the next two? Well, here's at least what the next one must be. The fivefold ministries are not there, and here's where the problem came. They're not there just to be important people in the church. They're there for a purpose. You ever look at an engine in a car? Here's the thing. The engine's there for a purpose. If the engine won't work, it's a useless engine. So the fivefold ministry are given to the church for this purpose, and this is what God has been leading to. For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for bringing them to unity of faith, to bringing them to maturity so they're no longer children tossed about by every doctrine. The next, this current move of God we're about to step into is a move, it's an end time move. The Bible sometimes calls it Joel's army. It's got different ways of talk, but it's a move of ordinary people who have been trained and empowered and released to go into every area of the community and carry the power and life of God. Now, we we can understand the teaching of it, but it's the visitation of God that makes it suddenly become a reality. That's why we need to pray. That's why we need to pray. 
this next end time move will be about ordinary people exploding with the power of God and touching people and praying for people in the streets, praying for them in the car parks, praying for them in their schools, praying for them in their work and seeing God do something. It won't be bring them along into the church. There won't be enough room in the church. It's pray for them where they are. Pray for them in the plane. Pray for them in the car. Pray for them in the car park. Pray for them on the side of the football field. Pray for them wherever you find them. Wherever you are, pray for the people. Minister the life of God. Let them see the power of God. Their next move of God as a great end time outpouring. It will activate believers to be like the New Testament church. They call the, the, the beginning of the church the former rain, the early rain. It was the spring rain that got the seeds growing. Then at the end came the latter rain, the great outpouring that brought the great harvest. We're about to experience a great outpouring of God and it involves you. It involves you. It involves each of you stepping up up in your generation to carry the move of God. Jesus will have, He will have what He's asking for. He will get there. He will get there. And what will come after that? Very clear. You can find it in the book of Daniel. He says, the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom of God. Jesus returns and then there's an upheaval and the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of God. Now, in order for God to do it, He's got to have a people. That's why the next move has to be about the people. It has to be about you. And what does that mean for you? It means, first of all, honouring and thanking God for the truths that other men paid a price for. That means step up if you're not saved. Give your life to Jesus Christ. If you're religious, turn away from dead works. Turn to the living God and trust salvation in Christ alone. If you're not water baptised, get water baptised. People paid a price for the truth that water baptism, I'm acknowledging, I've identified with Christ. My old life is dead. I'm coming to a new life to walk a different person. If you've never been filled with the Holy Ghost and speak in tongues, you need to reach out and say, God, fill me with the Holy Ghost. I need what others have got. This promise is for me. I want to be filled with the Holy Ghost and speak of tongues. Then you need to present yourself for training and equipping. Start to pray, build a prayer life. Start to study the Bible. Start to get to know some of these truths of the Bible. Turn up to courses where you can get trained. Go online to get trained. Get people who are anointed ministry. Lay hands on you to activate gifts, to release the life of God. That's what they're supposed to do. The problem in the past has been they've all got excited about their gift and their office instead of doing what it's supposed to do. Make other people function in that. Yeah. Don't matter how clever I might be and what I can do. The key question is, how many other people can do what I do? Yeah. The last decade, yeah. I've travelled the world equipping thousands and thousands of people how to move in prophecy, how to move in the gifts of the Spirit, how to move in deliverance. This is what the end time move looks like. It's the ministries equipping and empowering people to do the job. It's about you not sitting anymore, but saying, God, here am I, here am I. I want to be a part of that great end time army. I want to be part of your end time army. I want to carry the fire of God into our community. I don't want to be sitting among the complainers and moaners and criticizers. I want to carry a Holy Ghost fire, a Holy Ghost rebellion, a Holy Ghost stir up that I can carry that fire to touch others. This is what God is preparing you for. Go online, get the messages, study them, make them your own. Get a prayer life, build a strong prayer life. Start to press into God, ask Him to use you and stretch out. Look to God for a word for someone. It doesn't matter how small you start. Someone's got a headache, pray for that. Yeah. Someone's got something worse than that, pray for that as well. Don't be worried if you don't get breakthrough straight away. By faith and endurance, you get hold of the promises. You're called to be a great army. You're called to be the great end time army. And I believe it'll be people of all ages who have heard the voice of the Spirit to prepare for the coming of Jesus. God is needing a great army. He's needing people in every sphere of society. The only question is whether you'll be one of them, whether you'll be the one that when no one is looking, says, God, here I am. I present my life to you. Lord, give me vision for this generation. God, empower me to reach them. 
It'll be you when you turn up into a small group and you say, I won't do Christianity alone. I want to be part of a group meeting in a house and I don't want to sit there. I want to bring something from God. Man, when I got introduced, everyone who came had to share something. You got embarrassed if it came to your turn and you got nothing. You must be backslidden a whole week. That's all it took you. You would always come with something God was saying. We would always come, move in prophecy, always come, would always bring something. It's the body ministering that makes a strong church. You have got something to give. You say, well, I don't have much to give. Listen, don't think that way. Little kid had a handful of loaves and fishes. God said, that's enough. I can feed a crowd through that. Moses said, well, I'm not much. He said, what's in your hand? I got a stuff. He said, I can deliver a nation just with that stuff. I just need you to front up and say yes. It's just God's not looking for the clever. He's looking for the available. He's looking for those who serve Him. Those who say, Jesus, use me in this generation. Use me. Use me. Use me. Use me, Lord. Use me in this generation. Come on, let's give Him a clap. Give Him a clap. Come on. Let's get excited. If you're watching online, you need to get excited too. Come on, Jesus wants to touch you. Jesus wants to touch your life. He wants to impart to you today. Come on, let's give him a shout. Give him a shout. Give him a shout. I want to be part of that great end time army. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus. Come on, just lift your hands to the Lord wherever you are right now. Lift your hands to the Lord. I want you to lift your hands to him and make yourself available. Worried how clever you are, what education you got, or haven't got. He can use anyone who says yes to him and will faithfully follow him. I'm asking you to put your hand up today and say yes to Jesus Christ. I'm asking you to put your hand up and say, Yes, I'm available to you. Lord, here am I. Send me. Send me. I want to live my life as a sent person. So I commit my life to pray. I commit my life to study and get to know you through your word. And I commit my life to serve wherever the opportunity provides. And I'm asking today, Holy Ghost, for an outpouring of your spirit upon me. If that's you, lift your hands to him right now. If you're watching online, lift your hands. I'll lead you in a prayer. It's our prayer. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. I present my life to you now. A living sacrifice. I want you to use me in this great end time revival. I want you to empower me with your Holy Spirit. I present myself to pray, to be available, to serve you. I ask, Lord, you would fill me with your Spirit. Anoint me afresh and use me powerfully. Thank you, Lord. Come on, let's give him a clap right now. Give him a clap right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Your presence is here. Your presence is here. We can feel your presence. We thank you, Lord. We're part of a great end time move. We want to move forward. We don't want to hold on to the past. We say thank you for all you have brought to us. But Lord, take us further. Thank you, Lord. Amen. I believe I'm going to lay hands on people. You don't mind being hands laid on you. I want to pray for fire to come on you. I want to pray for Holy Ghost fire, for the anointing to prophesy, to act, activate in your life today. Because the, 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 the spirit of prophecy, it does something. When you prophesy, people get amazed. It touches their hearts. They feel God is near to them. It's one of the gifts every believer can function in. I want to pray for you that God will activate that gift in your life, that there will be a new level. Every day you pray, God, give me clarity. Today, I thank you. I hear your voice clearly. I instantly obey. Thank you, Lord. I hear you speak to me. Thank you. You're revealing the secrets of men's hearts. I prophesy life to people. I prophesy life to people. If that's you, just lift your hands to him right now. Begin to pray in the Spirit. 
The Holy Ghost, come on, lift it up. Lift up the energy. Lift up that worship. The Spirit of God is going to fall on some people now. Thank you, Lord. Oh, we reach out to you, Lord. We call out to you, Lord. A greater depth of prophecy. A greater accuracy in words of knowledge. I pray for the spirit of revelation. Wisdom. Words of knowledge. Prophecies. I pray for an outpouring of that anointing and mantle. Not just here, but also on those who are watching. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your presence here right now. I can feel his presence building over us right now. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, we present ourselves to you to be a voice to our city, hope to our city. One, two, three. Power of God, touch your lives right now. Holy Ghost, come, touch, 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 Holy Ghost. Fire upon them, fire, prophetic fire, revelation fire, 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 fire. Let the fire come, prophetic fire, fire, fire. Let the fire of God, fire, fire come. Songs, songs of David. Spirit of God, come, touch, touch. fire, fire, come upon his life. Prophetic fire. I call that gift to fire up again. I activate the gift. Fire, fire, come upon him right now. The fire of God, boldness. I bring timidity. Touch, touch, touch. You should powerfully, powerfully, powerfully. A voice of hope and healing. Touch a powerful, powerful move of God. Powerful touch of the Holy Ghost. Fill it with joy. Joy, 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 joy. Thank you, Lord. Spirit of faith upon the Lord. Touch, touch, joy. Joy in the Holy Ghost. Fill it, Lord. With the spirit of prophecy.
touching people. His presence is here. Release your anointing. The Spirit of God is here. God is touching people. I activate and release that anointing. Wherever you're watching, I break the prison house of fear. I break the prison house of rejection. I command the tormenting spirits to go. I release boldness upon you. I release faith in your heart. I release the anointing of is here so strongly when I was sitting in the meeting at the beginning I had the message all prepared and then God gave me different thoughts and I, I began to see a relay race 500 years men that heard God and stood up and spoke what God wanted them to say in their generation. They didn't have all the truth, they just had the bit God had given them. They had a lot of things wrong, but they had the bit God gave them for their hour. And they shook the world. And many gave up their lives. As I was just sitting there, I realized they gave up their life as an offering so we could carry this truth. Within a short time after William Tyndall died, the King of England made a proclamation. The Bible will be translated into English. Now we have the King James Version of the Bible. It came out of a man's sacrifice. He's not the only one. There were others. Baptists. They persecuted them, drowned them. The holiness people, they persecuted them. John Wesley was forbidden preaching everywhere. The only place he could preach was on his father's grave. So we stood on the grave and preached the gospel and thousands came to hear the word of God. He warned them, don't climb the trees to hear me. And many, 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 many didn't listen. They climbed the trees to hear the man of God speak. Then through the message you would hear thud, thud, as the power of God came on them and they fell out of the trees. People would come forth crying out to be saved. The holiness preachers, some of them preached and men ran to the front, weeping and crying. England was changed, Wales was changed, the prisons closed, the pubs closed. A move of God. How we need a move of God. It's happened in history. I want to be one at least that prays for it, but I'm longing to be part of it. What about you? The Pentecostals who got filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke in tongues, many of them were locked in the lunatic asylum. Just locked them up and drug them. Crazy. The latter rain, they were persecuted. So it goes on. But here we stand in a global change. Don't get focused on the dramas around you. Focus on the hour we live in and be part of the great purpose of God. 
Your role is not to complain about what's happening, to criticize what decisions are being made. Your role is to shine forth in the light as sons of God without murmuring or complaining. Your role is to bring hope. Your role is to bring the Word of God and the power of God. Lord, we cry out for a fresh move. We cry out. Come on, go give someone a hug and bless them today.